Matthew chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, continuing our series that I started last week, A Season of Light. Matthew chapter 2, verse number 1. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod about that time. Some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply troubled, or deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? They said, in Bethlehem, in Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. And he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. I preached for just a little bit on the guiding light the guiding light. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your spirit that is pervasive in this room today. Thank you that you have indeed met with us here. God, that every time we come to celebrate you, you meet us. For you inhabit the praises of your people. For you indwell the praises of your people. So when we praise you, you just have to show up. Lord, we thank you that you are here in this room. Lord, you are already here because you are omnipresent. You are everywhere all the time, but it's not enough, Lord. We don't want to just know you're everywhere, but we want to encounter you. And I thank you that you have come today. You have revealed your presence to us so that we could encounter you today. I thank you for your word. It is truth and it is life. Your word instructs, your word guides, your word informs. Your word is a lamp to our feet and a light into our path. We thank you for your word today. So Lord, I pray that you would marry the preaching of the word with the manifestation of your spirit. So the hearts and lives will be changed forever. We give you praise, we give you glory. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Matthew's gospel is uniquely written to the Jewish people. It is Matthew's intent when he sets out to write this gospel. And a gospel is just the good news, and the good news is that which is about Jesus, about his death, burial, and resurrection, and So when Matthew writes this gospel, he writes it to a people that understand and know the Old Testament, to a people that have a history with God, to a people who know the God of the Old Testament. They know who He is. They know the prophecies about the Messiah that is to come. And in fact, they are waiting and anticipating that coming of the Messiah It really goes all the way back to the book of Genesis chapter 3 when God would say that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. So since that time, all the way until 
the birth of Jesus, they were looking for the Messiah. I would even tell you that Jews today, many of them who do not follow Jesus, they're still looking for that Messiah, looking to the Old Testament prophecies about what the Messiah would be, when he would come, and how he would come, and where he would come. But Matthew, positioned by God to speak to the Jewish people, he begins the gospel unlike the others, he begins with the genealogies. And he walks through all of the generations leading up to Mary and Joseph, leading up to the birth of Jesus in the physical body and the the humanity that he would have. Leading up to that, he, he walks all the way through back to Adam, the Son of God, it would say, created by God directly. And then all of the subsequent generations. Why is that important? Because for the Jews, they know that the Messiah, he's coming through the seed of David. He's going to be of the tribe of Judah, so you have to prove that he belongs to the lineage. And he's got the proper birthright. He's got the proper genealogy. But Matthew, unlike Luke, which I will preach from next week, Matthew gives only eight verses about the process of the incarnation. Just enough to know that it was Mary who's espoused to Joseph and the Holy Spirit overshadows her and that child which is going to be born is going to be named Jesus for he will take his people from their sins and then it just, he's born and it, very little description of leading up to the birth of Jesus. It doesn't tell the story of going from Nazareth to Bethlehem, it doesn't tell the story of how they had to go because of the census. It doesn't tell any of that. It doesn't mention shepherds. It just cuts to the chase. Eight verses. It doesn't tell about the inn, and there's no room for him in the inn, and they can't find a place. It doesn't tell about the manger. It doesn't tell about the stable. There are reasons for that, and some of those would have to do with the Jewish understanding of shepherds, and they're the lowly people, and they're not the upper echelon, and so he just glosses over that, and in fact, he just skips it all together, other than the fact that it mentions that the Messiah is going to be a shepherd to the people. Can't leave that out, it's the prophecy, he has to include that, and so he includes that in his writing to the Jewish people. It doesn't set up the background necessarily of what's going on like Luke would do. It doesn't tell all of the the backstory. But it just then cuts to this idea that there are these wise men that are coming. And the reality is the wise men, it's some one to two years after the birth of Jesus before they get there. It's not like they can just hop on a jet. It takes time to get there. The situation into which Jesus is born, the Roman Empire is ruling most of the world. The majority of the the conquered and civilized world, the Roman Empire is over. There is a Caesar in Rome and he can't rule around the rest of his empire by himself. So he would appoint governors that would be rulers in a local setting. Herod the Great is the current governor of Judea. He's half Jew, half Idumean, and he had a relationship with the Romans, and so he gets a sense to power, and he gets appointed to be the governor of this area in around 37 B.C., some 30 plus years before Jesus would be born. He's a great builder. Everywhere you go, from Herodias and the, the city and, and various places that he would build, including the temple where he would make it grand and make it extravagant, trying to restore some of the beauty that Solomon's temple had. But Herod, he was a little bit paranoid, and the older he got, the more he believed that people were trying to take his kingdom, his governorship. They were trying to overthrow him. He would kill everyone who would have any claim to the throne. He killed most of his children. He had many wives, a number of them, and he would kill all of those because he would 
imagined that they were trying to overthrow him. It's into this setting that Jesus is born, but the text doesn't really go into all of that. It just, Herod is governor in Judea. And it just says these wise men or these magi coming from the east, these magi, they're not kings. We sing songs, we three kings and other songs at Christmas, but they're not kings, they're a combination of wise men and religious priests, most likely from Persia, which is modern day Iran. Same kind of wise men that Daniel would have been a part of when he is taken into Babylonian captivity and then when the Medes and the Persians would come in, he still had a place of influence. He's interpreter of dreams and understands a variety of different things. And these particular magi, they understood astrology. So, some one to two years before our text tells us this, they are looking into the heavens and they see a star. A star that's not supposed to be there. A star that is different than everything else. And because they understand the alignment of stars, they understand the symbolic meaning of the stars, they determine that the star is symbolizing that there is a king that is being born to the Jews. They're from Persia, many months of travel away. They're religious people. They have a certain level of truth, but understand all truth is really God's truth. If it's truth, then God is the origin of that. It doesn't matter who says it or where you think it comes from. It's really truth, and He is the essence of all of that. And so, so many months take place, but they don't actually start out right away. It's not a two-year journey from Persia to Bethlehem. And I say two years because in our text we read that Mary and Joseph and the child, not the baby, they are in a house. The child comes out of the house. Babies don't walk. Babies don't just come crawling out of the house. They're no longer in a manger, or in a stable rather. They're in a house in Bethlehem, and he's grown. So some year probably passes before they decide, you know what, this star it's still there. We've got to go see what this star means. We've got to follow the origin of this star to see what it means. And so they travel to Jerusalem. And they know the region that this star is hanging over. They don't know the exact place, but where would you expect to find a king but in the capital? Where else would you expect? to find a king but in the palace and so what do they do they go to Jerusalem and they go to the palace and they go to Herod and they say where is he that is born king of the Jews that question it's an interesting question because they know that the star symbolizes his birth they understand that this star not only symbolizes his birth, but they, they're talking to a ruler of the Jews who is not the king by birth. He's just been appointed by Caesar. And so they throw this out there. They know Herod's not the rightful ruler. So even in their question, where is he who is born? He's born to be king. He's born to sit on the throne. Where is this one? Herod, of course, doesn't know anything about this, but it troubles him greatly. He doesn't, he wasn't expecting this. He knew a little bit of the Jewish law and the Jewish prophecies, but he's not expecting Magi from the east to come and ask him this question. So since the government couldn't help, he brings in the religious leaders and asks them, where is the king to be born? They know exactly where he's to be born. They know he's going to be born in Bethlehem. They know that Bethlehem is the place. They don't know when. They don't know the exact timing. They're still waiting. And in fact, what I would tell you is these particular religious leaders, they know certain pieces, but they themselves miss the sign. And what you will see through the remainder of the ministry of Jesus is they continue to miss the sign. He would give sign after sign that He is the promised Messiah. Sign after sign that He is the prophesied one and they would just miss it because of their own desires. And They know 
the location, but they don't know the time and they can't see the star. They don't have the tools to be equipped to see this great light. So when they find out that the king is born in Bethlehem, to understand it's only about seven or eight miles from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, a couple of hours of good walk, a fast walking. But it doesn't appear that anybody else really saw the star. And when they leave the palace, something changes about the star. It appears to have changed and they are overjoyed when they see it. They're filled with joy because now what they were having to look at through telescopes and other means is now visible to them because they know where it is and they, they're looking at it and it appears to change and it actually moves in front of them. The Bible says that the star moves until it gets over the house where Jesus is. Much like the Old Testament, the pillar of fire in the wilderness, guiding them and leading them. This call back to that time when they were led, the people of God were led by a great light. Now these magi from the east, they're not, they're not Jewish. They don't even understand who the true God is, but they're still coming because there is a light that is shining. And they see the light and they want to come to the light and they want to find what the light represents. They want to find the one to whom the star is pointing to. The star guides them to the place where Jesus is. They see the child come out and they go in and they offer their gifts. And while all of that is great and that's part of the Christmas story, and, and maybe I've shattered some illusions of the timeline for you and When you do a nativity set, you, you've, got, you know, you've got the animals and Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus and you'll have some shepherds and the wise men. And I was reading an article the other day and the guy said, I don't care if you have wise men at your nativity, just put them in a different room. <laughs> just put them over another side, they weren't there yet. But they find... Jesus, and while all of that is good, what's instructive for us today is to understand this, that the light still shines. That the light of God is still shining today and still drawing people to Himself. That the light is still there. It's not invisible, but it is shining if you are looking and you know how to see it and you know what to look for. You can find the light, and when you find the light, you find Jesus. For some, it is like a moth to a flame. And if you know anything about moths, you turn on, you have a flame. Guess what? They're going to come close. That flying insects, they're attracted to the light. They're going to get close. They're going to want to see what it's all about. Moths to a flame. I just saw one for the first time in a long time in the last day or two. Spotlight. Shining from some location, and I didn't go to see where it was, shining up into the night sky. I believe it was Friday night, rainy and misty a little bit, and the spotlight shining up. When I was a teenager, it was all the rage in Louisiana where I lived that people were having an event. They'd get spotlights and shine them up into the sky, and if you didn't know what was going on, you could just follow the light. You could keep going to the origin of the light. But I would tell you, you may not see it, and other people, there's a light that's above this place today. Why is that? Because it is God drawing people to Himself. That God is drawing people and saying, this is where you can find help, and this is where you can find hope, and this is where you can find deliverance, and this is where you can find healing, and this is where you can find salvation. It is the light of God's glory that is still guiding people to Him. True Bible teaching churches serve as lighthouses in a dark world. If you know anything about sailing and if you've been by the sea, all of you I'm sure have seen lighthouses. They don't shine during the day because there's no need. But at night, when the navigation equipment wasn't invented yet and they didn't have all of the, the radars and the technology, lighthouses 
made sure that people knew that they were navigating ships, that they're getting close to the shore and there's danger. It was shining, and unlike the lighthouse, the light here is not, symbi- is not warning people of danger, it's calling people to hope, calling people to come and have an encounter with God. It is guiding people to Himself. God's light shines in the world to guide people to Himself. These wise men, they followed the light. Looking for the one to whom the light represented. The musicians would come. The technical term, of course, is magi, but most people call them wise men. While it's not original with me, it's a good play on words. That wise men today still seek the source of the light. That wise men still, when they see the glimmer of light and a follower of Jesus, or they see the light in a service like this, that wise men still seek the source of the light. And not only do they seek the source of the light, but wise men still come to worship the one they find who is light. These wise men, we assume there's three because there's three gifts mentioned. It could have been two, it could have been ten. The the Bible never says that it's three. It just says there's three gifts. These wise men... As they're getting ready to give their gifts, the Bible says they bow down to worship the child. So not only do these wise men still seek the light, but wise men still worship the light. And wise men still come bringing gifts. These three gifts that were given, they were in the treasure chest. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. People have often tried to identify the reason for these particular gifts. One of them, a spice that's used in burial, symbolizing the fact that he's this little babe in a manger. He's going to be he's going to be crucified at some point. He's going to die. Maybe that's true. The gold, that which is fitting for a king, he is born king of the Jews. We took an offering today. We take one every Sunday. That's not the gift he wants. That the God we serve today, he's not looking for gold. He's not looking for cash. He's not looking for coins. He's not looking for material goods. The thing He wants, it's only one thing He wants from you. And that is, He wants you. A children's Christmas song is part of a play The the late great potentate, and I've used this before, has a song that goes along with that. It says, I am the gift. That the only gift Jesus wants today is the gift of you. You may say, what am I? He's the king of all. What do I have to offer? Why would he want me? Just a used and tattered and torn gift. But you were created in his image. And for this purpose you were and are created to worship him forever. And so what he says is, I'm here for you. All I want is you. 
Your worth is because I created you. Your worth is because you can worship me. Your worth is because I love you with an unconditional love. But here's the deal. He doesn't just want a part of you. He doesn't want your Sunday. He doesn't just want your time of devotion. He doesn't just want you a little bit, but He wants all of you. Imagine, if you will, these magi going across deserts and rivers and mountains, carrying these gifts. No doubt they were on camels, I'm sure. This long journey and this long trek, and they finally get to the house where Jesus is. They bow down and they worship. They open the treasure chest. Pull out a few coins of gold. and This is for you. We'll keep the rest. That'd be silly to carry it all that way and hold on to it. We decided we need more money to get back home, so we're going to keep some of it back. You just never know when you're going to need more frankincense and myrrh. But all too often what people do is they come to Jesus. They see the light. They're drawn to the light. And then when they get to the light, Lord, I'll give you a little bit. Lord, I'll give you my Sunday. I'll give you this part of my life. I'll give you that part of my life. But you're the only gift He wants. But what He wants is all of you today. Would you stand together? I don't know if you feel what I feel. The presence of God is in this room today. And what He is doing is He has come to draw people into relationship with Himself. What I'm going to ask you to do is this. Would you gather around the front? We've got food and it'll wait. I preached extra short just for you today. Or maybe it's because I'm hungry. We've got a few minutes just to come and seek Him. If you're in relationship with Him and you've already given Him everything, just come and reiterate that. Just say it again, Lord. I'm continuing to give you my all. God, I'm come, I continue to come and give you everything. But if you're holding something back, it's your time to come and say, Lord, I give you everything. I am the gift you want, Lord. And I have been guided here by your light. I have been guided here by your light and all you want is me. And all I need is you. God, you want me, but I need you.